Good day. To understand the new Bible code, we first need a basic understanding of the God of the Bible. The same holiness, substance, and divine character, such as love, joy, and mercy, is the very essence which makes God who He is, and His unique nature, which we have depicted as water exists within all the three persons of God. Just as water itself does not stop being water, even if it is separated into three parts, so too can God himself exist in three parts and still be one God. Just as water does not lose its uniqueness just because it's in three containers. This is how God can declare that he is one God, yet also three persons. And for those of you who still don't understand, just imagine that God exists as three identical puzzle pieces, which all fit together to create one picture of God. 1 John 5 7 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are. 1. The very beginning of Genesis. God uses the word Elohim to describe himself, which is actually a plural form of the word God, because all three persons of God were involved in the creation process. Why else would God use a plural name to describe himself, unless he had more than one part to himself? And in Genesis 1 26, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Some maintain that God was speaking to the angels when he said, Us and our. But mankind was never made in the image of angels, but only in God's image. So he can't be talking to the angels, saying, Let us make man in our image. Clearly, there is more than one part to God. And as this verse shows, God does indeed talk to the other parts of himself. Which is exactly what Jesus did when he prayed to the Father. And God did not make one being but two. He made Adam and Eve. But for Eve to be like God, she had to be made of exactly the same DNA and flesh of Adam. Indeed, they were two separate beings, and yet they shared the same flesh and blood. For God took a rib out of Adam to make Eve so they were just, like God. For they both shared the same, flesh. Just as the Father, shares the same essence or flesh, with the Son. And the Holy Spirit, is the one who flows like water, between them. For he is the life and breath of God. So too, did Adam and Eve also, share the same life or blood. Which flowed in both their veins. The Bible tells us that the word of God, has always existed, with God. He was not created, because he himself, is also God. John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, was God. He was in the beginning, with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not even one thing, came into being that has come into being. In him, was life and the life, was the light of men. Clearly the Bible tells us that the word of God is a person, and that person is also God. Have you ever wondered what Jesus meant, when he said, I am the Alpha, and the Omega? This is another way of saying, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. But he is really saying so much more. Jesus was declaring, I am God. I am that part of God called the Word. The reference to the first and the last comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 44 6 says. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me, there is no God. So being the first and the last, is clearly claiming to be God. Which Jesus claimed. Now that we have clarified who the first and last is, let's move on. When John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, 
he's trying to draw the reader's attention, back to the beginning, of the book of Genesis. For the beginning was, when God created all things by his word. As you are aware, most of the New Testament, was originally written, in the ancient Greek. However, Jesus spoke Aramaic. So, while John writes in Revelation, I am the Alpha, and the Omega. What Jesus would say in Hebrew or Aramaic? Would be. I am the Aleph, and the Tav. Alpha, is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last. But the first letter, of the Hebrew. Is the Aleph. And the last, is the Tav. The real essence of what Jesus meant, can only be revealed, when we translate it back into Hebrew. And it's then that we discover, a wonderful secret. This phrase did not originate with the book of Revelation. But actually comes from the very first sentence, in the book of Genesis. So when Jesus says to John, I am the Aleph and the Tav, he is in fact clarifying, a mystery that has existed since the Torah, was first written. The first sentence of the Bible is most frequently translated, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. John's Gospel also begins with, in the beginning. And, right in the middle of the first Hebrew sentence of Genesis, is an untranslated word. Which you will only find, in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, it is untranslatable because it is not a word at all. It is simply, the Aleph, and the Tav. These two letters, have remained a mystery to the Jewish scholars for years. Actually, it is to this Aleph, and Tav, that Jesus was referring. Just as the book of Revelation begins and ends with Jesus saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So too does the Bible also begin, with those very same two letters, which refer to the word of God himself. The Aleph, and Tav. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being, that has come into being. Jesus is the word of God. He is God's word, from the first letter of the alphabet, the Aleph, to the last, the Tav. He is right there with God, in that very first sentence of Genesis. He is the living, word of God from Genesis, to Revelation. He is the mouth of God, and when he speaks, things are created, by his words. In him is life, because he is the one who spoke God's words, and brought us into being, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's not all. Amazingly the very first Hebrew word in Genesis, depicts the whole plan of God's salvation, for man. The original Hebrew, is not the same as the Hebrew we have today but has evolved, from Hebrew pictographs. These original Hebrew letters, bring amazing insight, into the meaning behind God's words. The first word in the Bible is the Hebrew word, Barashit. Translated as in the beginning. This is how the word, Barashit, looks in the original pictographs. It's comprised of the Hebrew letters, Bet, pictured as a house, or tent, and means house, as in the house of God. Rish, is pictured as a man's head, meaning the first or highest person. Aleph, is pictured as an ox head, meaning God and strength, as in the Lord is my strength. Shin, is pictured as, two teeth, meaning to consume or destroy. Yod, is pictured as an arm, from the fist to the elbow, meaning my hand or works. And Tav, is pictured as two crossed sticks, meaning a covenant or mark. The very first two letters of Barashit, the Bet, and Drish, form the Hebrew word Bar, which means son, as in my son. The Aleph is God. The Shin means destroyed. The Yod is the hand or works. And the Tav, are the two crossed sticks, which mean covenant. In John 2:19, Jesus said to the Jews, Destroy this temple, and in three days, I, will raise it up. Then the Jews said, This temple was forty-six years building, and will you rear it up, 
in three days? But he spoke, of the temple, of his body. Look at the symbol, for Bet. It is the very house, of God. In the form of man, the highest person. And amazingly these two letters together, formed the word for son. Yes indeed, the son of God referred to himself, as the temple of God. And clearly we can see that in the very first word of the Bible, God's wonderful plan of salvation, was prepared. That the Son, of God, would destroy, the sinful works of our hands. On the covenant cross, of sticks. Isn't that astounding, that the first word of the Bible, could contain so much truth? Without doubt God's plan to save man, was there from the foundation of the world. And the book of Revelation, 13 8, confirms this by calling Jesus, the Lamb. Slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, from the foundation of the world. From the first word Barashit, spoken in Genesis. But, there is an even deeper meaning, to the Alpha and Omega, the Aleph, and Tav, found in the first verse of Genesis. For in the original Hebrew pictographs, the Aleph, or Alpha, is portrayed as an ox head, meaning God, and strength. And the Tav, or, Omega, is the two crossed sticks of covenant. Yes in the Alpha, and Omega, we find the whole plan of God. That God himself, symbolized, by the ox head, would make a covenant, with man, by the cross, of sticks. Yes my friend. God the Word, became, like a sacrificial animal. The ox or lamb, which was slaughtered, as a sin offering. And he was placed, on that cross, of sticks. The Aleph, and Tav. The first and the last. Portrays the whole story of the Messiah. That God would place, his sacrificial animal, his strength, his leader. The Messiah. On a cross of sticks. As a sign, to mark, his covenant with man. It's absolutely astounding. That the ancient Hebrew, could tell the whole story of the Messiah. In two letters. And it's clear that the cross, was not originally a Roman symbol. But, a Hebrew symbol, which meant covenant. But the Jews wouldn't know this. Unless they had studied the ancient Hebrew letter, Tav. When God told Moses to write the Aleph, and Tav, in the book of Genesis, and told the prophet Isaiah, that he was the first and the last. God himself was declaring. You see this Jesus, he is the Messiah. Who is going to die on the cross, for the sinful works, of your hands. He, is the creator, who was in the beginning. He is the perfect sacrificial animal, placed on the cross of sticks. He is my word. He is my covenant. He, is my signature, my alpha, and omega. And he, is your salvation. So now we understand, why John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, was God. He was in the beginning, with God. So the Bible declares, that without the one, called, the Word, nothing would have come into existence. For the Word, is the part of God which spoke all into being, in John 14 7, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you, for so long a time? And yet, you have not known me Philip. He that has seen me, has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus declared that seeing him, was the same, as seeing the Father because Jesus himself, is the exact image, of the Father. Throughout the Old Testament, before his incarnation, Jesus was called, the arm of the Lord, and his right hand. Psalms 118.15 says, The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. Jeremiah 27.5 says, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by, my outstretched arm. 
How did God make the world? By his word. So when he says he created it by his outstretched arm. That arm, refers to the word of God. For the word of God is his power and strength, the word of God, is his right arm. And it's by his word that he creates. Now this is where it gets interesting. Isaiah 53 1. Says. Who, has believed our report. And to whom, is the arm, of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him, as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground. He, has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It's clear from this verse that the arm, of the Lord is a person. And that person was Jesus Christ. But as Isaiah says. Who, has believed our report. Indeed, who has believed, that God's very arm, his strength and word. Was revealed as a man. The prophet Isaiah, goes on to say that this man. This arm of the Lord. He was wounded, for our transgressions. He was bruised, for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, was on him. And with his stripes, we, ourselves are healed. Was there, such a man who claimed to take upon himself, our transgression? Was there such a man who was bruised for our iniquities, which are our sins, and lashed with stripes? A man who claimed, that he was bearing this abuse, for us. Indeed Jesus, was the one who claimed to be, that man. The prophet Isaiah goes on to say. All we like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. The iniquity, of us all. Iniquity, is sin. And God is clearly saying, that both your, and my sins, were laid, on this man. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought, as a lamb, to the slaughter. This is why John the Baptist cried, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Because the prophet Isaiah, called him a lamb, for slaughter. Isaiah says, He was taken from prison, and from judgment. And who, shall declare his generation? For he was cut off, out of the land of the living. For the transgression, of my people, was he stricken. Clearly this man died, because it says he was cut off, from the land of the living. And, for what reason? He was killed because of transgression, it was for sins. He was killed, for the sins of God's, people. Clearly this man was killed, as a sin offering. Yet it pleased the Lord, to bruise him. He has put him, to grief. When thou shalt make his soul, an offering for sin. Clearly God says that this man was indeed, an offering, for sin. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant, justify many. For he, shall bear, their iniquities. Isaiah says this righteous servant, will bear, or carry, our iniquities or sins. Because he, has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered, with the transgressors, and he bare the sin, of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. Who is this man, who died, bearing the sins of many? And made intercession to God, on behalf of these sinners. He is Jesus Christ. But Isaiah says, he was not, an ordinary man. He was God's word. A part, of God himself. His very arm, in human flesh. Who came, as a righteous servant, to do the will, of the Father. When Jesus returns to reign as king. The prophet Zechariah says, that someone, will ask him. What, are these wounds? In thine hands. Then he shall answer. Those with which I was wounded, in the house, of my friends. Who was this person who was wounded, in his hands? Wounded by his own people. These wounds in the Messiah's hands. Are the same ones prophesied by David. For dogs, have compassed me. 
the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced, my hands. And, my feet. Indeed the Messiah's hands, and feet, suffered violence. And they were torn. As he was nailed, and hung on that cross. God sent the angel Gabriel, to announce to Mary. That she would bear the word of God, as the Messiah. God's promised Saviour. And when Mary agreed. Then, the word of God left heaven. Philippians 2 5. Says. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Thought it not robbery to be equal, with God. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon himself the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. The prophet Isaiah, wrote. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, shall be called Wonderful. Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Clearly the Bible says that this son, would be called, the Mighty God. Therefore, he was equal with the Father. But to save mankind. He had to humble himself under his Father. And ascend, to earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. To become, a lowly man, and, a servant. The angel told Mary. The Holy Spirit, shall come upon thee. And the power of the Highest, shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that Holy One, which shall be born, of thee. Shall be called, the Son, of God. Jesus himself spoke these words, saying, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that, whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God, did not send his Son into the world, to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved, through him. He who believes on him, is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, of God. Why does God say, that if you do not believe in the name of the Son, you are condemned? It's because the name, which was given to the Son, contains the saving power, of God. The original name, given by the angel to Mary, was not Jesus, but it was the Hebrew name, Yeshua. In Matthew 1:21, the angel says, And you shall call his name Yeshua. For he shall save his people, from their sins. You see in the name, was the very purpose of God. To save people, from their sins. Which is why Yeshua, means Yahweh saves. Or, Yahweh, is salvation. This is the name which God said, you must believe, to be saved. For if you do not believe, that Yahweh came to save us, from our sins, then you have no hope of being forgiven. The very name of Jesus, has been written throughout the Old Testament, about one hundred times, all the way, from Genesis to Habakkuk. Yes, the very word, the very name, that the angel Gabriel used in Luke 1:31. When he told Mary about the son, she was to bear. But where, do we find, that name? Here it is my friends. The Old Testament word salvation. Especially when it has the Hebrew suffix, my, thy, or his salvation. And it's the very identical word, Yeshua. Which is the name Jesus in Matthew 1:21. Let us remember, that the angel who spoke to Mary and Joseph, did not speak in English, Latin or Greek, but in Hebrew, and neither Mary nor Joseph failed to grasp the meaning, and significance of the name of this divine Son, and its relation to his character, and his work of salvation. For in the Old Testament, all great people were given names with a specific and significant meaning. For example in Genesis 5:29, Lamech, called his son Comfort, but we call him, Noah. And Lamech said, This same shall comfort us, concerning our work and toil of our hands. In Genesis 10:25, Eber, 
calls his firstborn division. But we say Peleg. Because in his days, the earth was divided. And the continents split apart. The same is true, of Abraham whose name God changed, so that it would mean father of many nations. The same is also true of Sarah. God also changed Jacob's name, to Israel. Because it meant, God's prince. In Exodus 2:10, Pharaoh's daughter, called the baby rescued from the Nile drawn forth. But we say, Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Every biblical Hebrew name has had a deep significance. Now then, when the angel spoke to Joseph, the husband of Mary and the mother of Jesus, this is what he really said. And what Joseph actually understood. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Yeshua, meaning salvation. For he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1:21. So let us proceed to show clearly the Hebrew name Yeshua, which means salvation, which in Greek is Jesus, and in English is Jesus. In the Old Testament, when the great patriarch Jacob was ready to depart from this world, he, by the Holy Spirit, was blessing his sons and prophesying their future experiences in those blessings. In verse 18 of Genesis 49, he exclaims, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. What he really did say and mean was, I have waited for thy Yeshua Jesus, O Lord. That makes much better sense. Of course, Yeshua Jesus was the one, whom Jacob was waiting for. Indeed he was waiting for God's future Messiah. And trusting that God's future salvation, would carry him safely, through death. Jacob was a saved man. He did not wait, until his dying moments to start trusting in the Lord's future Messiah. For his salvation. He just reminded God. That he was, trusting in God's salvation, God's Yeshua Jesus. And was at the same time comforting his own soul. In Isaiah 12 3, we have something wonderful. Here, salvation is mentioned two times. Let me give them, as they read in the original Hebrew, with Jesus as the embodiment and personification, of the word salvation. Behold, God, is my salvation. I will trust, and will not be afraid. For the Lord, the Lord, is my strength and song. And he, has become, my Yeshua. Indeed God did, become, our Yeshua, our salvation. For the Bible says, and the word became flesh, and dwelt, among us. In Psalms 118 21, David prophesied saying, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me. And art become, my Yeshua, my salvation. The stone, which the builders refused, is become the headstone of the corner. Yes David also says that God, had to become, salvation. He had to become, Yeshua, which is salvation. Then he says something amazing. The stone which the builders refused, is become the head of the corner. Here, David links Yeshua Jesus, directly to a stone, which the builders rejected. Who were the builders? They were the Jews. They rejected the stone. But who, is the stone? He is the God whom David called, the rock. Yes, the rock, of our salvation. Or in Hebrew, the rock, of our Yeshua. In other words, David said the Jews, would reject the God of salvation. And Yeshua Jesus, was, that stone, that rock. Whom they refused, and rejected. Just as the prophet David said, they would. The prophet Isaiah called him, a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel. Indeed today. Every Jew is offended by Jesus. For they believe he was an imposter. But, if they had read the Bible, they would have seen, that God said, that they would reject him, and be offended by him. The prophet Isaiah says. Therefore with joy, shall ye draw water, out of the wells, of Yeshua. 
This is none other, than a reference to waters of salvation, which flowed from the side, of the crucified Saviour. When the soldier pierced his side, and blood and water, flowed out. Isaiah 60-11. Behold Yahweh, has proclaimed, unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter, of Zion. Behold thy Yeshua cometh, behold, his reward is with him. And his work before, him. Jewish people maintain, that Yeshua, or salvation in this verse, is a thing. Or an event, which is related to Israel. But it's quite clear. That in this verse. Salvation is a person, and not a thing. Or an event. Why? Because, he. Comes. His. Reward is with. Him, and his work before. Him. Yes, my friend, salvation is a person. Clearly, Isaiah declares that Yeshua, salvation, in the Old Testament, is not a thing or an event. Salvation is a person. And it was the very name given to Jesus. Now, going on to the book of Habakkuk, we have the greatest demonstration of the name Jesus in the Old Testament. For here, we have both the name, as well as the messianic title, of the Saviour. In 3.13 we read from the original Hebrew. Thou wentest forth with the salvation. For thy people. With Yeshua. Thy Messiah. Which is literally, with Jesus, thy Christ. Thou woundest the head of the house, of the wicked one. Which is Satan. Amazing. The very name given to our Lord in the New Testament, Yeshua, the Messiah, or in English Jesus the Christ. The exact title the prophet Habakkuk said, he would be called. So don't let anyone, Jew or Gentile, tell you that the very name of Jesus, is not found in the Old Testament. For the prophet Habakkuk, was given the honor of revealing his very name, to the world. As. Yeshua thy Messiah. And there is no doubt, that this is a reference to the Messiah. For the prophet not only names him but declares, that he is the one, who shall wound, the head of Satan, the wicked one. Which is a direct quoting of the very first prophecy, God gave Adam and Eve. About the Messiah, who would be the offspring of a woman. And would wound Satan's head. In Genesis 3:15. God says to the serpent Satan. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours, will always be enemies. Her offspring, which is the Messiah, will bruise your head. And you, will bite her offspring's heel. God clearly declared, that even though the Messiah, would overcome Satan by bruising the serpent's head. He would also be bitten on the heel, in the process. Clearly the Bible says that the Messiah would also be wounded. And what type of wound? A serpent's bite. What does a serpent's bite, look like? Two holes. Was Jesus heel bitten? Indeed it was. For the Romans drove nails, through his heels. To nail him to the cross. Leaving him with the same marks, a serpent would leave. Two, holes. And, if the Messiah was, bitten by a serpent, why wouldn't we, expect that bite, to be, fatal? For many have died from serpent bites. And that, is exactly what happened. For even though the Messiah overcame Satan on the cross, he also died, of the injuries he received. Let's take a look at the Hebrew word, for Messiah. In the ancient Hebrew, for we find something amazing, in that name. The Messiah's name is made up of the letters Mem. Which means, mighty. Blood. And water. And its ancient pictograph is water. Shin, which means to consume or destroy. And its pictograph, are two teeth. Yod, which means works or hand. And its pictograph is an arm, or hand. And Chet which means tent, wall, or separation. And its pictograph is a wall. Look how wonderful, the name Messiah, is. 
for his very purpose, and reason for coming, is revealed in his name. For it reads, The Messiah's mighty blood and water destroyed the sinful works of our hands and the tent wall, the separation. Yes, it says his mighty blood and water destroyed the works of our hands and the tent wall, which separated us from God. And this is exactly what happened. For when Yeshua died, the Bible says with a loud cry, Jesus died. The curtain, hanging, in the temple, was torn in two, from top, to bottom. Mark 15 37. Yes, both blood, and, water, flowed from Christ's side, and destroyed, the works of our hands, tearing down the wall, or separation. That, was the whole purpose, of, the Messiah, to reconcile us with God. To undo, what Adam and Eve had done. When they put, the whole world, under sin, and Satan's control. So God, sent his Yeshua Jesus, to save us, and the world, from under Satan's control. For Adam and Eve, were cast out of the presence of God, in the garden. Because of their sin. But the Messiah's, mighty blood, now gives us the way back into the presence of God. Because his blood, destroys sin. And God tore the temple curtain, from top, to bottom. Declaring that the way back, into his presence, was now opened. Isn't it amazing? That God's plan, had been written in the name Messiah. All, along. Heaven too is the presence of God. And unless we come, through Jesus, we can't gain access. For the veil of heaven, is still closed, to those who are sinners. Just like Eden, was close to Adam and Eve. It is only through Christ Jesus, that we can once more gain access to the presence of God. In John 14 6 Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, comes to the Father. Except, through me. Jesus made it clear. No one will enter heaven. Except through him. And his atoning sacrifice. In the Old Testament. God told Moses. That the only way, for him to cover. Our sins. Was if the blood, of a sinless animal. Was poured out for us. Taking our place. This is why Leviticus 17:11 says. For the life of the flesh, is in the blood and I have given it to you upon, the altar, to make an atonement, for your souls. For it is the blood, that maketh an atonement, for the soul. Leviticus 16 15. Then he Aaron, shall kill, the goat, of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring its blood, inside the veil. And he shall do with that blood, as he did with the blood of the young bull, and sprinkle it, on the mercy seat. Exodus 24, 8. And Moses took the blood, and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you. Concerning all these words. As you can clearly see, not only was blood. For the atonement of sin. But it was also used. To seal a new covenant, between God, and man. This is why Moses took the blood of the oxen, and sprinkled it over the people, as a sign, of the covenant. But God also promised, a new, covenant. Jeremiah 31 31 says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make, a new, covenant. With the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. This new covenant, was the very one which Yeshua the Messiah, brought confirming it with his own blood. As Moses had confirmed the old covenant, by sprinkling the blood of animals upon the people. But Jesus confirmed this new covenant, with the cup, of Passover. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them saying drink, all of it. For this, is my blood, of the new covenant, which is shed for many, 
for the remission of sins. Just as Moses had sprinkled animal blood upon the twelve tribes of Israel to seal God's covenant, so too did Jesus seal the new covenant with his twelve apostles, declaring that the cup of Passover represented the blood of the new covenant, which would be poured out on the cross for our sins. And this exactly mirrored the high priest who poured out the blood of animals as a sin offering to make atonement for the sins of the Jews. As we can see, the covenant of Moses and Jesus are identical. But the prophet, Jeremiah, said God would bring a new covenant. Because the Moses covenant could only cover Israel's sins, not wash them away. Which is why there was a continual need for animal sacrifice. But God promised a new covenant, which would deal with sin once and for all, not just cover it. Hebrews 10 4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. For this reason, when Christ came into the world, he said, You did not want sacrifices and offerings. But you, Father, prepared a body for me. The prophet Micah declared that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Micah 5 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. The prophet Micah declared that this Messiah, who is to rule Israel as king, has existed for eternity, from everlasting. Yes Micah declares that this Messiah is eternal. And this is only possible if as John said the word, who was the eternal God, descended from heaven and became flesh. And it's because he is eternal that the life, in his blood, is able to atone eternally, for our sins, once, and for all time, and does not need to be repeated, as the animal sacrifices had to be. When Jesus was crucified, Pilate wrote the sign, that was nailed to the cross. The particular wording he chose displeased the Jewish leadership, and they asked him to change it. He refused. There are some interesting aspects to this incident, that are not apparent in our English translations. John 19:19 says, Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus from Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Then the Jewish high priests told Pilate, Don't write, the king of the Jews. But that this fellow said, I am, the king of the Jews. Let's take a closer look, at the Hebrew. For what we don't notice in the English translation, is that the acrostic made up of the first letter, of each word spells out, a name, in Hebrew. And that name, is Yahweh. If Pilate had rewritten it, in the manner the Jews had requested. It would not have spelled out the name of God. His inscription declared that Jesus, was both the King, and God, of the Jews. Whether it was intentional or not, Pilate, proclaimed, that Jesus was both Yahweh, and King of the Jews. After the Father had raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus had declared that he was now, alive and had shown himself to more than 500 people at one time. His followers watched him, ascend into heaven. Acts 1 9, he was taken up, while they were watching. And a cloud, took him out of their sight. The prophet Daniel tells us exactly what happened. After Jesus ascended to heaven in the clouds. Daniel 7 13 says. I saw in the night visions, and, behold one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, dominion, and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages, should serve him.
his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that, which shall not be, destroyed. Yes the Son of Man, mentioned by the prophet Daniel, is Yeshua, the Messiah. And the title Son of Man, was often used by Jesus, to refer to himself. And he now sits at the right hand of the Father. As King of Heaven. It is he, of whom David said. The Lord, which is speaking of the Father, said unto my Lord, which is the Son. Sit thou, at my right hand. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Clearly David is declaring, that he has, two, lords. For the one, says that the other, sit at my right hand. This is speaking about Yeshua, ascending into heaven. And the Father placing his Messiah, at his right hand. Just as the prophet Daniel had, seen one whom he called the Son of Man, being given God's kingdom, to rule. For that is the very place, from which the word of God had originally come. Before, he descended to earth. And the prophet Daniel says the Father, gave the Messiah, back his glory. The glory which he had had, before he descended to earth. This is why Jesus said in John 17 5. So now, Father. Glorify me. In your presence. With the glory I had with you. Before the world, existed. How could Jesus, have shared the Father's glory? Before the world, came into being. If he was not there already. With the Father. In Isaiah 42 8 God says. I am Yahweh, that is my name and my glory. Will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images? Clearly if God will not share his glory with another, then Jesus must be a part of Yahweh. For Jesus clearly said, that he shared the glory with the Father, before the world existed. Let us take a closer look, at the name Yahweh. For this is the God to whom the glory belongs. In Hebrew, the name God called himself, consists of four letters. Yod. Hey. Vav. Hey. Let's see what happens. When we translate it back to the original ancient Hebrew. Straight away you can see. That there are two figures. In the name of God. This is none other than the Father and the Word. Hebrews, 1 3 declares, that Yeshua Jesus, the Word of God, is the reflection of God's glory and the exact likeness, of his being. Yes the Bible says that Jesus, has exactly the same nature, as the Father. This is why, we see two figures, in the name Yahweh. For both these beings have the same, nature. And both, are the same God. Yahweh. This is why Jesus was sharing, the Father's glory, before the world existed. There is something else quite astounding in the name of Yahweh. In ancient Hebrew, the letter Yod, is depicted as a hand, or an arm. The He, is depicted as a human figure with raised hands, meaning behold. The Vav, is the nail. And the final He, is again the human figure, meaning behold. Thus, it reads. Hand, behold. Nail, behold. Yes my friend, God's Hebrew name, points to the nails in the hands of Yeshua Jesus. For Yeshua raised his hands, just as the name of Yahweh portrays. And the nails, were driven, through those raised hands. My friends, to be saved. We have to behold, the hand of God. And, behold, the nails of crucifixion, in the raised hands of God. The Jewish people, still await, their Messiah. But the Messiah can no longer make, his first appearance. Because God, set an exact time frame, in which he had, to appear. God said, the Messiah's birth, had to take place before the scepter, departed from Judah. Genesis 49 10 says. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver, from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Jewish people know, that Shiloh, is a reference to, the Messiah. 
But what is the scepter and lawgiver of Judah? That will not disappear. Until the Messiah comes. The scepter, and lawgiver, departed from Judah, in about 7 AD. It was when the rabbis lost their right to execute the death penalty. When Pilate, told the rabbis to judge Jesus themselves, they answered, It is not lawful, for us, to put any man to death. See, they had lost their lawgiver. And their scepter, of self, rulership. The Genesis 49:10 prophecy states that the Messiah, Shiloh, had to be born at a time when the rabbis still had this power, or scepter. And it clearly states that the scepter and lawgiver would only depart after the Messiah had appeared. And indeed, Yeshua Jesus was born just before the scepter and lawgiver departed from Judah in 7 AD. The prophet Daniel declared that the Messiah had to appear, while the temple was still standing, and before, it was destroyed. Daniel 9:26 says, And after sixty-two weeks, Messiah, shall be cut off, which is killed, but not for himself. And the people of the ruler who shall come, which was the Roman emperor, Titus, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with the flood and ruins are determined, until the end shall be war. Clearly Daniel says, that the Messiah, would be killed, but not for himself. But, for us. And then the ruler, shall destroy the city and temple. It's an undeniable fact, that this happened in 70 AD. Yet the Messiah was supposed to come, before, the temple was destroyed. Yes before. For Daniel clearly shows that the ruler Titus would only destroy the temple. After. The Messiah had come, and been killed. Some Jewish scholars, claim that the Messiah just, means, anointed. And therefore refers to King Cyrus. But Daniel clearly shows, that this, Messiah, would be, cut off. Which is killed, not for himself. But for others. In fact the 62 weeks mentioned, are part of a timeline given to Daniel. The prophet Daniel, was in Babylon, when an angel appeared to him, and gave him, the messianic timeline. In Daniel 9:25, the angel says, Know, then, and understand that from the going out, of a word, to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, to Messiah the prince, shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in times of affliction. The angel spoke about seven weeks, plus another sixty-two weeks. A week was equal to seven years. So the angel said that there would be a period of forty-nine years, plus another four hundred and thirty-four years, until the Messiah, appeared. The total number of years was 483 years. The angel told Daniel, to start counting, when the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem. In 457 BC King Artaxerxes, issued the decree, allowing the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem, and set up a government. So let's start counting. Adding 483 years to 457 BC brings us to the year 2627 AD. The very year, in which Yeshua Jesus, started his ministry. And was baptized by John. And then Daniel 9:26 goes on to say that he would be cut off, which is killed, after those 69 weeks. And this is exactly what happened. Amazingly God's word can mathematically prove, that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Leaving us without any doubt, you may be asking. What about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God's life. And his breath. And he lives, within both, the Father and the Word. And he, is the person who connects the Father and the Word together. Uniting them, as, one God. The prophet Joel prophesied. That one day God would not only pour out his Spirit upon the prophets. But upon all mankind. Joel 2:28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward, 
that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Jesus promised that once he had ascended to heaven, he would send the Holy Spirit to abide with us. And exactly as the prophet Joel had declared, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost came all of them were together, in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the roaring of mighty windstorm came from heaven, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw tongues, like flames of fire, that separated, and one rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them that ability. Acts 2 1 4. Yes, my friend. The breath that God breathes is the Holy Spirit, the third person of God. And God has poured out His Holy Spirit on those who accept the words of Christ. Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The water he is speaking of are His words. For His words, wash us, and purify us, like water. And the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, whom God gives, to those who believe in the words, of Jesus. So to make heaven, we have to believe in God's Word, the Bible, and be filled with His Holy Spirit. Otherwise Jesus said very clearly, that we cannot, enter heaven. Jesus said, He, who believes on the Son, has, everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son, shall not see life. But the wrath of God, abides, upon him. Jesus said for God, so loved the world, that he gave, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is why the angel said, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua, meaning salvation. For he shall save, his people, from their sins. Do you believe, that Jesus, was God's Son, the Messiah? That God the Word, became your salvation, your Yeshua? And bore the penalty of your sins, up on that cross, of covenant? My friend, God, loves you, so much. To get right with him. We have to recognize, that we are sinners, in need of forgiveness, and cry out, to God for his mercy. I hope, that you will pray this prayer with me, today. My Father, I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe that he died, and was resurrected, and is coming back as King to judge the world. My Father, I, repent. Please, forgive me, of all my sins. Come, into my heart, and make me, your child. In the name, of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have said this prayer, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Amen.
Spirit, the Holy Catholic Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in 